Okay, guys, this is the last talk, actually. Um, we are getting into like very unsafe and very scary lands. Um, so the last one is going to be, how do you actually interact with something which is completely memory unsafe or completely memory crazy as RDMA? Um, and this guy here, Andrea, is going to guide us through all these difficulties and corner cases. Um, so a round of applause for Andrea. All right, folks. Uh, thanks for sticking around, by the way. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, really, really wildly unsafe stuff. Uh, let me give you some context. I'm Andrea, uh, and I am a PhD student at ETH Zurich. We do systems research of various kinds, and at some point, I ended up, I ended up started playing with uh, high-performance networking, kernel bypass, uh, ways to uh, do better than what we can do with TCP over, over a kernel. Uh, and I stumbled upon uh, RDMA, which is a, a pretty well-known uh, technique, at least in the area, for doing uh, fast networking uh, without having to rely on the kernel TCP stack. Additionally, RDMA um, is, a, is, a, is an interesting piece of software or piece of technology because it allows writing and reading uh, from memory on a different machine without that machine's CPU involvement. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So here's a, here's a bit of a um, kind of executive summary of what the talk is going to be about. Uh, we're going to see how we can use some of the Rust uh, ownership and safety semantics to make DMA look a little safer uh, than, uh, than um, we might expect. And here's, uh, here's the problem. So. We have hardware, and uh, this hardware has direct access to program-owned memory. So this is, you know, a vector you have allocated, and there's some hardware, a network card, that can go and write directly to it without the CPU even knowing about it. Uh, so this seems like in contracts with uh, safe, safe Rust, for example, where we know that we are guaranteed if you're writing Safe Rust code that we uh, don't have data races. Uh, data races, quick refresher, is uh, that defined by the Nomicon as uh, two or more threads concurrently ac accessing a location of memory. One of them is a write, so one thread is writing to this location, and one of them is not synchronized. This means that essentially we don't know what the result of the operation will be because we don't know in which order they will apply. In fact, in some cases we might see a partial write um, in the, because we end up reading the, uh, the memory location midway through the write operation. So scary stuff. Uh, and now we are also talking about not even just two threads, but even a thread on a CPU and uh, a piece of hardware, a network controller, that can go and directly access memory uh, independently of the CPU. So uh, we'll see how, if we think about hardware operations, as a thread of control, as if it, there was an, another thread in, on the CPU, we can use Rust ownership semantics to uh, make this look a little safer. All right, so uh, there we go. Uh, leverage ownership, and this will allow us to prevent uh, data races between CPU and hardware. So, uh, right, let's uh, have a look at what RDMA is. In fact, I'm going to talk about specifically IB verbs, which is uh, a pretty standard interface uh, for RDMA hardware. And it, um, RDMA stands for, again, Remote Direct Memory Access. And um, IB verbs is uh, the library that lets uh, user space code interact with uh, RDMA hardware to do remote memory operations. So. Here's uh, a, a simple uh, uh, scheme of what, uh, what's going on. We have two compute nodes. They are connected by maybe some InfiniBand network. Even TCP works these days. And uh, there is a program running on both, a, a network NIC, a, a network card uh, connected to both that connects them together. And uh, with RDMA, we can do things like the following. Uh, the CPU can tell the NIC, here's a buffer, the shaded area on the left. Uh, please go and grab it from my memory. Don't ask me about it anymore. And go and write it into the remote process memory uh, directly. And as you can see, node 2 here is the recipient of this operation and has no control over this. The CPU is not involved at all. And this is really interesting for uh, some high performance work because this means that we can do networking without having to spend any CPU cycles on it. Though, of course, this uh, from you know, a Rust program's perspective is 
pretty scary. We have some some buffers in memory that are being written and read by something that's not even another thread of control. It's just just some hardware. So uh, of course the opposite might be true as well. The CPU may say here's a buffer. Uh, it will register it with the NIC and say here's uh, where you can write in data that comes from, from somewhere else. And uh, we can have an operation that writes from, for example, from node two to node one without the CPU being involved in this at all. All right, so I lied a little bit. Uh, of course, computers are complicated and uh, there is uh, not just one address space for everything. Every process has, has its own virtual address space that's mapped to the physical address space, the RAM of the machine. Uh, and so uh, what we need is for the NIC, for the network card to know this mapping. We are saying here's a buffer in our application, represents some, some data. Uh, we need to tell the network what physical address in RAM uh, this, uh, this data corresponds to. Uh, so when we set up buffers with a RDMA-enabled NIC, we need to tell it, yeah, there, there's an address in virtual address space, here's an address on, on your physical RAM, go ahead and write and read it, uh, write to it and read from it whenever you want. In addition, we also need a way to, for the process to communicate with the, uh, with the NIC directly. And ideally, we also want to pro probably not involve the kernel in this. If we can do this directly from user space, why not? And the NIC can already access physical memory directly. We have uh, determined this. So what it can do here is uh, allocate a queue, which is just a memory region that uh, we agree upon between the process and the NIC, and uh, in queue operations in this memory region where the NIC can go and grab it. All right, uh, introduction done. Uh, we have said that we have these mappings between memory regions buffers in our process and uh, whatever the uh, network card understands. Uh, these are encoded as buffer descriptors, which are essentially just structs that contain some information, the pointers and the, and the length. And uh, if we want to do, for example, a send operation, we want to take some piece of memory on the local machine and copy it to our remote machine, uh, we need to figure out a couple of things. First of all, how to request operations. So as I said, there's a queue area where we can encode operational requests, and we have two things there. There's a transmit queue, which uh, represents uh, the operation that we have requested the hardware to do, and we have a completion queue, which is uh, the list of things that have completed. So the uh, card, whenever it completes an operation, will enqueue something in that list to let us know that, we, that it's done. This is, of course, fully asynchronous, which is also one of the really cool properties of working with a system like this. So let's say we want to send a piece of data. Uh, we enqueue uh, the operation request. The, uh, this uh, will be picked up by, by the NIC. Um, maybe we enqueue another one. We can do this asynchronously. Don't have to wait for the operations to complete. And then uh, at its leisurely pace, the uh, RDMA uh, hardware can go and grab it. Uh, perform the operation, so write, go and read directly from our memory, write it on the remote machine memory, and once it's done, it's going to enqueue a completion. So it's going to say, yeah, uh, we are done with that. Uh, as you can see, we have a pointer to the descriptor that represents the piece of data that we're interested in working with. All right, uh, there is uh, a uh, uh, converse to this, which is uh, how do we receive data from somebody else? we need to tell our hardware where to put the data that comes in, right? And so what we do is we have a list of what we call posted buffers. Uh, these are just areas of memory that we decided are useful for receiving data from, uh, from somewhere else. So uh, we say, okay, let's uh, post a couple of buffers because we are expecting to receive data from somebody else. And whenever the NIC receives information, it doesn't have to consult us anymore because we already told them where to go and write the data. So the CPU is not involved again. Uh, it's going to grab the first post buffer that's available, make the write into our memory, and then post uh, a piece of information on the receive queue. It's going to say, okay, that's done. All right, so we have a send, we have a receive, but that sounds uh, like a roughly normal um, messaging, messaging system. Um, what's next is it's kind of tricky to use these APIs directly. So the IBverse API are C-based, are pretty low level. So uh, uh, Claude in my group uh, has done some fantastic work uh, in wrapping 
uh, a lot of these abstractions into object-oriented C++ style code. Uh, and uh, his PhD has been on running massive uh, join operations on thousands of cores based on this code. So uh, let's take a look at how uh, Infinity, uh, Cloud's library, uh, deals with this. So uh, we have uh, the uh, buffer uh, abstraction, which just represents the fact that uh, is a class that represents the fact that we have a descriptor and uh, associated memory with it. Also, uh, we can, for course, of course, construct a new one. Uh, constructing it mean just, just means, hey, allocate a thousand bytes and uh, register it with the card, let the kernel know that we don't want to, for it to move it, uh, do all the bookkeeping, essentially. And then once we have that, we can, of course, go and take a look inside. And this should be terrifying to any self-respecting Rust programmer. We are grabbing a raw pointer uh, to the contents of this, uh, of this memory. And uh, we can write and read uh, uh, from it whenever we want. And if we want to perform operations on the receiver hand, we post a receive buffer, uh, which means we are getting ready to receive something. So we need to uh, inform the NIC where to write the data to. And then we just wait for something to show up. We call receive that just um, will return it as soon as, as uh, something is available. Send aside, similarly, uh, we instantiate a request token, which essentially represents the fact that we are enqueuing this operation and we, we need to wait for it to complete. Uh, and uh, we call send. And then through the request token, we can essentially determine when the card notifies us that everything is, has been done. Cool. Uh, all right, so we have a C++ library. Let's wrap it in Rust. Uh, the uh, strategy is a pretty typical one. Just use bind gen to generate mappings. Uh, there's a, the, the talk before was, was, a, was a good introduction to some of uh, the tricky bits uh, of uh, how to map C++ semantics into, into Rust. Um, the uh, class library doesn't make much use of like advanced, I guess, C++ features, so it was uh, relatively straightforward to work with. Uh, but uh, here's, here's a straightforward wrapping of, of the buffer uh, class in, in Rust. We just uh, maintain a pointer to the uh, C++ uh, data structure. Uh, we can uh, construct a new one, so just a call through to C++. And then maybe we want to be able to read and write to it, right? So we can grab a mutable reference uh, to the underlying uh, memory, uh, is lice, and we can go and read and write from it. Here I'm, see, I'm showing a DREF mute. Uh, there is also an implementation for DREF that lets us have multiple uh, immutable references to destruct. All right. Uh, so if you've seen that and you think about Rust ownership semantics, and data races, that should be a little worrisome. So we have a way to construct a buffer. We can grab a reference to it and read and write from it. But it turns out ah, there's somebody else with that can do this, right? The network card, as soon as we constructed the buffer and posted it, also has access to this data. Now, that's a data race, isn't it? So uh, here's, here's an idea. What about we think of the NIC as just, you know, something else that can have ownership of Rust uh, memory addresses and memory locations. And what we can do is we start out with uh, Rust owning the uh, uh, descriptor to, to the buffer. And whenever we are ready to enqueue it and say, okay, we are going to perform an operation to it, rather than just saying, here's a pointer to it, just go ahead and queue it, we relinquish ownership from the Rust side for this buffer. And so we just like give it to the NIC. And it's going to vanish from our Rust world, essentially, for a little bit, until the card tells us it's done. So until we are guaranteed that the card is not going to try and write or read into it anymore. And when that happens, OK, then uh, we go back and we get ownership back. All right, that's the theory. How do you write this? Uh, we have the buffer definition, as we've uh, said. Pretty simple. Uh, we construct a, we create an interall function that just lets us take a buffer, a owned type to Rust buffer, and make it vanish. Uh, as you can see, this call is taking self by value, so we are moving the buffer in. A buffer is not clone, importantly, and um, whenever we call interall, the buffer will disappear from our Rust world. Uh, after that, we have from raw. 
which is the opposite way. So we are essentially reconstructing a typed buffer in Rust from thin air from, from a raw, raw pointer here. Um, all right, how do we use that? Uh, that looks eh, maybe some, a little bit terrifying, but at least now we have a clear boundary of when we as Rust programmers have control of the buffer or, uh, and when the rest of the world, the hardware, has control of it. So for writing a send operation, for example, uh, we want to be able to call send. Uh, this is a Q pair is the interface to, to, the, to the NIC. Uh, and what we do is have send, which is, as you notice, is not unsafe. Uh, it will take the buffer uh, by value. It will take its ownership away. So we are relinquishing the buffer here. And you will notice that the return type doesn't contain the buffer anymore. So we are losing track of the buffer here. And uh, we construct this request token, which lets us keep track of what's going on with the operation, but doesn't let us access the buffer at all. And we call the interrupt function that we defined before. So here the buffer is disappearing into uh, Nick uh, um, Nirvana, I guess. And uh, all right, done that. Uh, we want to return something for the user to be able to get uh, the data back, so uh, return the request token. Cool. Uh, all right, so we've seen essentially this operation. Like we enqueue uh, a new operation, which is the equivalent of losing track of, of the buffer, and then at some point we get a completion. So how do we handle the completion? Once we've done sending the buffer, we don't have, want to lose control of it forever because we're going to just leak memory uh, over and over again. Once the operation is done, we want control back. And the way we do this is by uh, having a, this request token that's just an opaque pointer into uh, C++ land. And once the operation is completed, we call wait, if we call, call wait until completed, it's not going to return until the operation is completed. There are also asynchronous functions for this. Uh, and once, only once the operation is completed, we'll get back the buffer. This means that we can now reuse it. So we lost track of it for a little bit. Uh, ownership has been transferred to the RDMA hardware, but now it's back to us. All right, uh, so uh, have the request token that we keep track of and note that the function, again, takes ownership of self um, and then we wait until completed and call from raw. The way we reconstruct a uh, strictly typed Rust buffer. Cool. Uh, all right, how do we use this? Uh, this is a simple example. It's probably not super realistic, but I should give you a kind of a vague idea of how the API looks like. So we construct, we initialize all the uh, global RDMA initialization, um, and let's write a receiver. We construct a new buffer, we post it uh, so that the NIC knows where to write the data, and then we wait for something to show up. And as you can see, whenever we actually receive something, we get this uh, receive buffer back, which is our buffer, the one where we posted before. But importantly, between these two calls, we lost control of the buffer. Sender is uh, similar, just the other way around. So I instantiate a buffer, uh, write some data into it, post it, post it, call send, and here is where we lose ownership. And so we have no uh, um, risk of being able to write to it while the card is operating on it. And then we wait until it's completed and get the ownership back. So uh, this is kind of the, uh, the way we went about this, which is, I, I believe is a, is a kind of a cool way to extend the uh, Rust ownership semantics to also include things that are not on the CPU anymore, it's hardware. Here's a couple of comments on things I, I came across. So as, as you noticed, the uh, send operation, for example, has, a, has this unsafe block. And if you read the Nomicon, uh, unsafe marks the piece of code that's, uh, that's unsafe, where we're doing unsafe operations, and we should be careful. So maybe when we start writing unsafe, uh, we, we are careful that at the boundaries of this block, we make sure that everything is safe again. Uh, another example, the request token wait until completed, there's this unsafe block that separates the unsafe land from safe land. Unfortunately, if you look at the unsafe boundary, things are complicated. So when we, whenever we call send, we relinquish the buffer. Uh, this is a safe a function. Whenever we call wait until completed, we get it back. But so we know that things are going to work out as long as only these two functions exist. But wait, what if, what if we have another operation that we implement? Somebody else comes in, doesn't really realize what's going on, and they implement clone for request token. This means that we can 
arbitrarily duplicate request token as many times as we want and get back as many copies of the same buffer as we want. And now, okay, we're back to the start, right? Data races galore. In fact, in undefined behavior because multiple um, uh, mutable references. Also, I lied. Uh, there is another bug in this, in this slide, which is this. Uh, I just uh, added a multiple reference to that, and that just makes everything unsafe again because that means we can generate arbitrary numbers of buffers out of a single request token. Oops. Uh, so what's the deal here? Safety is non-local. All the reasoning we need to do to make something safe, to wrap an unsafe library with safe code, requires global reasoning. We need to think about all the other ways we interact with that piece of data. We cannot just think about it from a certain point of view. So, uh, read Nomicon, there's a fantastic explanation on why this uh, happens. Uh, it's really well done, uh, and it's really complete as a good example. Uh, but here's the summary. To be able to write safe abstractions, we introduce invariants. For example, that something is only owned by us or by the NIC. And then we rely on these invariants to write nice to use stuff on, in user space and in safe Rust code. Unfortunately, safety depends on all of these environments that we have uh, introduced anywhere uh, in our uh, unsafe and safe Rust code base. So what can we do about this? We cannot really keep track of all the things that happen in the whole program. So just use ownership and privacy, so private members, to limit the scope uh, to which these environments apply to. So the only thing that acts with buffer in our API is um, is this um, the function I wrote. And the only entity that can go and do things with the buffer is our wrapper. If we had other entry points to this, we would be in trouble because we would need to think about all of them every time we'd make any API change. So try to limit the scope of your, of your expectations. And yeah, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, a cool way to wrap uh, C++ uh, unsafe galore, um, a RDMA library uh, that uh, helped us do it in, in a kind of nice way. And as a final uh, word, I'm just going to remind you, all of you, that the Nomicon is fantastic. Uh, the quality of the explanation has uh, really improved over the years, and I strongly recommend reading it cover to cover if you're doing any unsafe rest. All right, that's it. I have questions. Thank you. Right. Uh, the question is whether the uh, C++, in fact, library underneath is asynchronous. Yes, it's really very much designed to be. So uh, you really want to post. So posting an operation isn't an asynchronous operation because it's very cheap. But the operation itself will happen asynchronously under the covers. In fact, you're not even aware of it. So in that sense, it's really asynchronous. Uh, the, you, you have seen blocking to wait for things. That's not how you would actually write an application. You typically see what has shown up since the last time you looked uh, in an asynchronous fashion. A bit of possibly like a non-blocking socket might look like. It really depends then on the application design. Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, do we really need to make it completely disappear from safe Rust uh, um, when we give it out? Because if we keep it private, then nobody has access to it anyways. Uh, that's fair. Um, there was a choice made out of mostly convenience with interacting with the C++ API. But I guess the, the, the strong point here, you can totally do what you just said uh, as long as you think about precisely where your boundary is. And as long as your boundary is consistent among all the all the places where you do this. Yeah, that's a, that's a totally good point. So if you're, what he's saying is that uh, doing that uh, would allow us to fix one of the problems. So the mutable reference to to the buffer. Uh, 
if the underlying FFI buffer wasn't cloned, uh, then that would um, provide a guarantee for us. I believe it is by default, unfortunately, but that's a very good point. Uh, so the uh, bind gen, uh, uh, bindings are, are good, but require a lot of care determining which one of the things that BindGen thinks are safe, in fact, are. So uh, by default, I would recommend not relying on uh, BindGen's uh, expectation of what it has written. It will probably try and generate a clone implementation for you, even though it's totally unsafe to do so. All right, very good question. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Uh, so the question is, uh, I've done uh, seemingly really dangerous things. How do we go about testing them, and what are the tools that we could use for this? And uh, I guess, word of warning, I'm a researcher. I have an engineering background, so I've done industry for a few years, but now I'm a researcher, which means that my interest in testing is limited to saving me time rather than making things completely and super stable in production. That said, um, I think various forms of uh, kind of deterministic but randomized testing is really good for something like this. Uh, so if you can introduce random weights or random uh, thread interleavings between you and the card and whatever happens, uh, that's something that uh, definitely helps. Uh, you, there's the deterministic rate, for example, that does a good job at this. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's, it's uh, really tricky to, I, I don't think I have a good answer on what I would use to kind of prove the safety of this. There are really cool research level approaches to doing uh, composable safety proofs of complex Rust programs that use like wildly unsafe features. Uh, they are not easy to use yet. So I think, I think that's possibly one of the things where, you know, I'm excited to see what academia comes up with next. There's really cool work out of my university that will let you write proofs in Rust itself. Because Rust already gives you us to so much that ending up doing like formal verification is, um, is a lot easier now because Rust is so cool. Uh, right, the question is, is that TLA plus? Uh, it isn't. Uh, you could use TLA plus and try and prove that something like this is, is safe. You wouldn't have to then translate it to Rust, which is always potentially error prone. The, uh, no, the, the Rust work I've been talking about is specifically for the Rust language, and it's language embedded in Rust. So you literally write proofs in, in, uh, in Rust, which is really awesome. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in verification and things like this, have a look. It's really cool. All right. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> All right. How do I handle drop of the token? Um, how do I handle drop of the token? Right. Good question. Uh, drop safety is hard. I read about it. Uh, it's harder than you think if you haven't read about it before, or at least it was for me. Um, Dropping a token for me isn't a problem. So leaking is not one of the safety properties of Rust. There's no, uh, uh, there's no guarantee that you will not leak. So dropping a token for us just means leaking the buffer. So it's non-desirable behavior. So it's one of those cases where you might reach for something like must use, but uh, it's not strictly unsafe which is a bit of a cop-out of an answer, but there you go. <laughs> uh, more time? No, we're done. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, happy to talk more offline.